The 1974 Huntsville Prison Siege was an 11-day prison uprising that took place from July 24th to August 3rd, 1974 at the Huntsville Unit or the Texas State Penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas. The standoff was one of the longest hostage-taking sieges in United States history. Texas State Penitentiary at Huntsville or Huntsville Unit, nicknamed Walls Unit, is a Texas state prison located in Huntsville, Texas, United States. The approximately 54.36-acre facility near downtown Huntsville is operated by the Correctional Institutions Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, administered as within Region 1. The facility, the oldest Texas state prison, was opened in 1849. The unit houses the State of Texas Execution Chamber. It is the location of the 11-day standoff. Fred Carrasco started killing people early and often. Fred was put into American jail at an early age, violated parole, and was later put into a Mexican jail. Once he escaped from that, he was a drug business murder machine. The general public heard of Fred in April 1973 when a $3,000 reward was offered for the information that would lead to his arrest. It seems Fred was the likely suspect in the gangland slaying of Gilbert Escobedo at the Bustamante Ice House on Paracel Road. Both police and sheriff officers called Fred extremely dangerous and allegedly in charge of one of the biggest narcotics rings in the country. They added that Fred had been seen in several cafes in South Bexar County accompanied by two bodyguards. He was finally run to the ground on July 21st of 1973 at the El Tejas Motel on Roosevelt on the south side. After a couple of hours of stakeout, police watched a Carrasco-connected car pull up in front of room 10. When Fred walked out, police moved in. He got off one shot and missed, and police fired at him, striking his arm and knocking the gun, a brand new 357 Magnum, out of his hand. Police later described Carrasco as the most dangerous man the San Antonio Police Department had ever captured. Carrasco was wearing an expensive suit and custom boots that had a compartment for extra ammunition. Police had no doubt he would have kept shooting if the gun had not been physically separated from him and if his wife had not been behind him in the motel room. His murder trial was scheduled to start January 7, 1974, in Corpus Christi, on a change of venue. Fred surprised most everyone by pleading guilty, a deal made to keep his wife out of prison. He was sentenced to life, retroactive to the day he was arrested. The report in the San Antonio News pointed out that he might qualify parole in 15 to 20 years. Prosecutors were so nervous about Fred Carrasco's ability to kill or escape, he was rushed to prison in Huntsville just 24 hours after he pleaded guilty to murder in Corpus Christi. From July 24th to August 3rd, 1974, Frederico Gomez Carrasco and two other inmates laid siege on the Education Library building of the Huntsville unit. Fred Carrasco, the most powerful heroin kingpin in South Texas, was serving a life sentence for attempted murder of a police officer. He was also suspected in the murder of dozens of people in Mexico and Texas. Having smuggled pistols and ammunition into the prison, he and two other convicts took 11 prison workers and four inmates hostage. Precisely at the moment when the 1 p.m. prison whistle sounded, a convict limped into the third floor library, brandishing a 38 caliber pistol. Get out of here, he shouted at the other prisoners as he ordered them down the ramp from the library. When two guards tried to come up the ramp, the convict fired at them, hitting one in the foot. Both fled. Two other convicts, also carrying pistols, joined the first, and they slammed shut the double glass doors of the library. Trapped within were 15 people, 10 employees of the state Texas penitentiary at Huntsville, including seven women and four prisoners who were not involved in the breakout attempt. Thus began on July 24th, the longest seizure of hostages in the agitated history of U.S. prisons. The prison warden and the director of the Texas Department of Corrections immediately began negotiations with the convicts. FBI agents and Texas Rangers arrived to assist them as the media descended on Huntsville. The story broke at 1.30 p.m. Wednesday, July 24, 1974. Only a sketchy wire report that three prison inmates had taken a dozen hostages made the front page of the Chronicle's Night Markets edition. Reporter Tommy Miller drove the 50 miles to Huntsville and filed an overnight story. In quote, prison officials get ready for assault. He got the assignment in part. 
because a year earlier he had profiled the ringleader of the escaped attempt, Fred Gomez Carrasco of San Antonio. Four of the gangster's associates had turned up dead, and police theorized that Carrasco, rumored to have killed 40 people in Mexico, had avenged their attempt to move in on his heroin smuggling operation. At age 34, he was called El Viejo, the old man, wrote Miller. The story said a Spanish ballad about Carrasco was sung at the dance halls around San Antonio. In Huntsville, temperatures were in the 90s, and it was raining. Then city editor Zarco Franks sent a copy messenger with an envelope of cash to buy chairs and a table, rain gear, food, and ice. The Chronicle's makeshift outpost was equipped with a hastily laid phone line. Later, the city put up a tent shelter for the dozens of reporters covering the story. The phone company provided a trailer equipped with payphones, although the Chronicle hung onto its own line. Across the street from the improvised press setup was the grim red brick walls unit, begun in 1847, the birthplace of the sprawling Texas prison system. Inside were cell blocks, the death chamber, and an infirmary. On the third floor of its classroom building, the drama was being played out, unseen by reporters. Carrasco and inmates Rodolfo Dominguez and Ignacio Cuevas were armed with revolvers and cartridges that had been smuggled inside of a ham and cans of peaches by a prison trustee after being threatened by Carrasco. The hostages included teachers, librarians, fellow inmates, and a Catholic priest, Chaplain Joseph O'Brien. Carrasco's lawyer said his client vowed to die rather than live, quote, caged up like an animal. Reporter Larry Cooper's July 27th story quoted Carrasco as saying, I've got plenty of ammunition and I'm ready to use it. I'm ready for anything. In another story, Carrasco threatened, quote, to finish them off and kill as many people as possible if we are provoked or our demands are not met. On July 25th, Miller and Cooper reported that officials were seen taking clothing to Carrasco after he demanded three tailored suits, three pairs of nun bush shoes, three shirts and ties, cologne, and toothbrushes. Another story said that prison officials delivered 17 steak dinners to Carrasco from La Sierra, one of the city's finer restaurants. The ribeyes and fillets were all cooked medium, served with baked potatoes and tossed salad. They cost $78.75 at group rates, the story said. Carrasco negotiated with Texas Department of Corrections officials. He wanted walkie-talkies, bulletproof vests and helmets, more weapons, and an armored truck to make a getaway. Carrasco claimed that they were planning to flee to Cuba and appeal to Fidel Castro. If Castro decides to shoot me, he'll be doing me a favor, said Carrasco. Dominguez declared that he, too, was preparing to die. Cuevas, who does not speak English, asked a Spanish-speaking newswoman to kiss his wife for him, for the last time. He got a surprising amount of his demands met, although TDC officials did everything as slowly as they could without putting the hostages in further danger. Carrasco, in his own way, returned the favor, treating the hostages well, releasing two who had health problems and making sure the inmates left the female librarians alone. Then things settled into a sort of routine for ten days, punctuated only by shoplifter Henry Escamilla's drive through a plate glass library door on the fifth day. He escaped but needed 200 stitches to close the cuts he received. After a grueling 11-day standoff, the convicts finally made their desperate escape attempt just before 10 p.m. on Saturday, August 3, 1974. In considering his possible escape, Roscoe's problem was the library at Wall's unit wasn't a simple brick building. It was actually on the third floor of a large building in the open courtyard of the prison, and to get in or out required traversing four connected ramps that twisted and turned on one another. This kept guards from making a mass assault on him, but left him with a problem. How was he going to make his own way down the long concrete ramp and survive? His answer was to build a mobile armored vehicle out of two chalkboards, covered by dozens of law books taped to the outside for makeshift armor. Inside it, each of the three convicts would walk out, handcuffed to a female hostage, while the other hostages walked on the outside, held in place by more handcuffs. Carrasco had warned that if the TDC officers tried anything, the inmates would shoot the women who were with them. TDC director W.J. Estelle had actually allowed an armored truck to be pulled up in front of the library and was ready to roll, since he knew one of the inmates would be sent down to examine it. He also knew TDC could not allow a successful escape, 
since that would likely result in hundreds of more attempts from the tens of thousands of prisoners in the department as well as the deaths of hostages. When the chalkboard escape pod, dubbed the Trojan Taco, started its way down the zigzag ramp, officers turned on several high-pressure fire hoses meant to knock it down and allow them to rescue the hostages. It didn't work. Carrasco, Cuevas, and Dominguez started blazing away with their pistols, and officers shot back, aiming at tiny gun ports in the crude fortress. When the vehicle got stuck on the first turnaround in the ramp, Carrasco and Dominguez realized the attempt was over. Both shot the women with them and a priest, Father O'Brien, as luck would have it, who had volunteered to act as a go-between. O'Brien survived. Both Yvonne Peseda and Judy Stanley died. Carrasco then shot himself in the head. When the officers rushed the soaked mass of wreckage, Dominguez seemed to make a move and was shot dead. After 11 days of waiting and 20 minutes of terror, the most complex and deadly breakout attempt in the history of the Texas Department of Corrections was over. Later that night, prison system director James Estelle told the gathered reporters that the siege was over. Carrasco and Dominguez were dead and Cuevas in custody. Water said Estelle's voice broke as he announced that teacher Elizabeth Peseta, age 46, and librarian Julia Stanley, age 43, had also been killed. The Reverend O'Brien and inmate Martin Quiroz were wounded. Estelle called the outcome the best we could have hoped for under the circumstances. Allowing an escape, he said, was never considered. Syndicated columnist Cal Thomas, who was an on-site reporter for Houston's KPRC-TV at the time, later wrote, it is a tragedy that two hostages died. It is a miracle all the rest lived. It took 17 years and three trials before the surviving conspirator, Ignacio Cuevas, was executed for his part in the siege. Like all Texas executions, it occurred out the Walls unit just a few dozen yards from the library. 25 years after the August 3, 1974 shootout, the newly remodeled library was named the Beseda Stanley Building to honor the two women who had been murdered after volunteering to accompany the convicts as hostages in the armored car, a sacrificial offer that had placed them in that fatal inner circle beside the desperate men. What follows now is original news footage from the tragic events that took place. In the state penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas, armed convicts have seized 11 hostages. A spokesman says eight convicts are involved, and the prison chaplain is trying to convince them to surrender. The Texas State Penitentiary at Huntsville is under siege tonight for the second straight night. Inside, convicts with guns are holding hostages, some of whom are women. The convicts are being led by a man serving life for a murderous assault on a policeman. Outside, the prison is surrounded by, car by guards carrying rifles and shotguns. And both sides are negotiating. George Lewis is in Huntsville, and here is his report. Several times today, the convicts threatened to shoot the hostages, but prison authorities kept bargaining for extra time. The ten hostages include one guard and several prison system school teachers and librarians, most of them middle-aged women. Prison officials believe seven inmates are involved in the escape attempt. They identified the leader as 34-year-old Fred Gomez Carrasco, the former head of an international narcotics ring. This was just the latest in a series of violent run-ins between Fred Carrasco and lawmen. One year ago, when this film was taken, Carrasco was captured following a shootout with San Antonio police. He had been a fugitive on both sides of the Mexican border. Authorities in Mexico believe Carrasco was responsible for at least 40 murders but he drew a life sentence in Texas for attempting to kill a policeman. Now, Fred Carrasco wants out. He and the other inmates have demanded automatic rifles, ammunition, helmets, and bulletproof vests. A prison spokesman read the demands. We are making these demands with determination that if they are not met, we will be obligated to put all the hostages except the inmates to death. We will not commit such an atrocity unless we are provoked or that our demands are not met. 
As negotiations with the convicts continued, guards began bringing in extra arms and tear gas, saying they hoped the weapons wouldn't be needed. Carrasco, meanwhile, has been quoted as saying he would rather die than spend a dog's life in prison. George Lewis, NBC News, Huntsville, Texas. Since Wednesday, a group of convicts headed by murderer Fred Gomez Carrasco have held 11 hostages in the state prison at Huntsville, Texas. Today, Carrasco told officials that one hostage had been shot in the shoulder, and that, one official said, changes the game plan for ending the revolt. ABC's David Snell reports on the continuing drama, beginning with last night. Night brought a moratorium on negotiations between convict Carrasco and prison officials. Morning brought new demands. Tailor suits, uh, none bush shoes, shirt, tie. At a later point in time today, very probably there will come a demand for transportation. Families of the hostages were able to talk with their loved ones by telephone. One who did was the daughter of the prison school's assistant principal. My mother trusts Mr. Arasco to do what he says he will do, whether it be set them free if they're allowed to leave or to kill them if they are not. They're preparing to leave if allowed to. I don't know how long the negotiations will go on. Mom is afraid not very long. My mother and her other teachers want to leave with these people. There are too many lives at stake now to keep them up there. In other words, your mother is asking prison officials to let She's go. She's begging, begging for her life. Of Convicts at the state prison in Huntsville, Texas, are still holding 11 persons hostage. Prison officials say that they have learned that one of the hostages, a teacher there, had been shot in the shoulder yesterday. The wounded man is reported in good condition, but a prison official said the shooting sharply challenges convict Fred Gomez Carrasco's pledge not to harm the hostages. The spokesman said the development requires a new game plan, but he didn't explain what that means. Earlier, prison officials said they will meet Carrasco's demand for tailored suits, ties, and expensive shoes for himself and two Here other convicts. home in Huntsville, Texas, the siege at the state prison goes on. Seven convicts, led by a life-termer named Fred Gomez Carrasco, have been holding 11 hostages since Wednesday, demanding freedom. One hostage, the prison librarian, was wounded when the revolt began. Prison officials first learned that today. Here's more on the story from George Lewis. This morning, prison officials resumed negotiations with the convicts, hoping the siege would be over soon. But as the stalemate continued, those hopes began to fade. There were new demands from the convicts. Their leader, Fred Carrasco, wanted some street clothing and some toilet articles. Prison officials agreed, and the items were taken into the area where the inmates are holding the hostages. Carrasco later let the hostages telephone their families. Seven of those being held are women, prison teachers and librarians. The daughter of one of the women relayed a plea from her mother to newsmen. I'm out here because my mother has asked me to come. She's asked me to talk to you, to beg Mr. Estelle and the officials for her life and for the lives of her teachers and the other hostages. My mother trusts Mr. Arasco to do what he says he will do, whether it be set them free if they're allowed to leave or to kill them if they are not. Later this afternoon, prison officials said they had learned one of the male hostages had been shot in the shoulder yesterday morning. The officials say they continue to hope the siege can be ended without additional bloodshed. But just in case there's another kind of ending, the emergency room of a local hospital has been put on special standby, stocked with extra supplies of blood. George Lewis, NBC News, Huntsville, Texas. The siege at the Texas State Penitentiary at Huntsville went on today for still another day. Three convicts hold 15 hostages, many of them women, inside the prison. The convicts, led by a drug dealer and a suspected murderer, want safe conduct to another country. Outside, police and prison officials kept guns trained on the prison and pondered what Funeral to do. Funeral services were held today in Huntsville, Texas for the two women hostages who were killed in the shootout this weekend at the Texas State Prison. Convict Fred Carrasco and one of his two Confederates were also killed when they emerged from the prison inside a makeshift shield made of strapped together blackboards and library books. ABC's Charles Murphy reports on the funeral of one of the victims. This morning, friends and relatives of Mrs. Julia Stanley came to her funeral. 
some of the guests, prison officials and hostages who survived the gun battle, returned to the same Presbyterian church later today for the funeral of Mrs. Elizabeth Besseda. Both women died inside Fred Carrasco's makeshift shield. Mrs. Ann Fleming, who was strapped to the outside of the shield, came. Mrs. Novella Pollard, the only one of the four hostages inside the shield who was not wounded, came supported by her daughter and a lawyer she has engaged. Mrs. Stanley's five children and their father, Troy, a former FBI agent, entered the church. The small church was filled. Mrs. Stanley had volunteered to walk out of the library with Carrasco. It was a courageous act, and to her minister, there was clear meaning in her death. This family has fully and completely supported the actions of the Texas Department of Corrections and Mr. Estelle, as director. Never once have they privately or publicly criticized him for what might have been done. They want you all to know that men must do certain things and women must do certain things and people like Judy Stanley must be willing to die if peace and life and joy is to exist in this world. Most townspeople agree with the Reverend Pickett. They believe authorities had no alternative but to do what they did. Outside, Mrs. Pollard and Mrs. Fleming cried in each other's arms. During their ordeal, Mrs. Pollard made several calls to her daughter to pass on Carrasco's demands rather than go through the warden's office. For this, the Pollards were criticized by some, but today Mrs. Pollard had only praise for the way authorities handled things. Charles Murphy, ABC News. In Huntsville, Texas. A final autopsy report on the 11-day siege at Texas State Prison in Huntsville said today Fred Carrasco, the convict ringleader, died of a single bullet wound in an apparent double suicide with a fellow convict. Also in Huntsville today, funerals were held for the two hostages who died in the shootout last weekend. Ed Rabel reports. The gunfire erupted just after nightfall. <laughs> Afterwards, officials found the bodies of two rebellious inmates and two women hostages, teacher Elizabeth Besseda and librarian Julia Stanley. The funeral for Mrs. Stanley was held this morning in this community whose economic existence depends on the prison and other state institutions located here. The dead women's families and the surviving hostages have supported prison officials for how they handled the incident, declining to criticize the violent way the ordeal ended. In his eulogy, the Reverend Carol Pickett made it clear such criticism would be out of place. This Stanley family is here today to tell you that Unfair criticisms and second guessings have no place in this city, in this state, or in this nation. They want you all to know that men must do certain things, and women must do certain things, and people like Judy Stanley must be willing to die if peace and life and joy is to exist in this world. The minister recounted phone conversations with Mrs. Stanley while she was being held in which she said she was not afraid to die. A note she wrote to him included the phrase, life is preparatory for death. There were tears after the service as surviving hostages who had spent almost 11 days together trapped in the prison library embraced. The nightmare in the prison was over, but the awful task of forgetting has just begun. Ed Rabel, CBS News, Huntsville, Texas. When I was a senior at seminary, one of the professors said, I am convinced that you're going to spend most of your ministry dealing with death and dying. In 1974, I was minister of the Presbyterian Church in Huntsville. Jim Estelle, who was director of prisons, called me one day to come to the Wall Street. He said, we've got a real bad situation over here and I need your help. I had never been to the prison before. In the state penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas, armed convicts have seized 11 hostages. The hostages include several prison system school teachers and librarians. 
prison authorities identified the leader as Fred Gomez Carrasco, the former head of an international narcotics ring. Now, Fred Carrasco wants out. Outside, the prison is surrounded by guards carrying rifles and shotguns. Police and prison officials kept guns trained on the prison and pondered what to do. Jim Estelle was a member of my church and a good friend. He said, I want you to minister to the families of the hostages. And then he hesitated and he said, two of your church members, our church members, are hostages. Judy and Yvonne lived two blocks apart. They sat two pews apart in the church. And they were two of the finest people I had. My mother and her other teachers want to leave with these people. In other words, your mother is asking prison officials to let She's you go. She's begging, begging for her life. In Huntsville, Texas, the siege of the state prison goes on. I spent 11 days and 11 nights with the families of the hostages. No siege in America had ever gone this long. It was just a question of how many were going to die. Carrasco later let the hostages telephone their families. Children, yes. I love y'all. Mother, we're going to be Don't worry, we're going to be back. On Saturday afternoon, I talked to Judy and she said, this is what I want for my funeral. She knew she wasn't going to make it down. She knew. And then Yvonne got on the phone. And she told me what she wanted for her funeral. And I couldn't go back in and see the family. They were going to leave the prison in this protective shield the convicts had built. Inside, Judy and Yvonne would be handcuffed to the inmates. And the plan was to knock it over. When they hit the water, the end finally came. One of the convicts, Ignacio Cuevas, was arrested. And there's the picture. That is a unforgettable picture. Rudy Dominguez was shot after he had killed Yvonne with a bullet to the chest. Fred Carrasco killed Judy with five shots in the back. You can see that there's lots of blood here. And I walked out and I said, I will never come to this place again.